Our subject this morning deals with the mystery of the human body. And I think it is probably proper, in a sense, to start with the beginning. In this case, we know that the physical body of the human being is sustained, developed, and unfolded by the use of available physical energies. Our body is composed of practically every element that we know exists and others that we do not know. We realize also that, as Plotinus described it, we come into a world in which most of the elements necessary for health and integration are already polluted before they are built into our own organism. We breathe in pollution with the first breath of life. We find pollution present in the body of the mother, pollution that cannot be entirely avoided. The parent has to live upon the food products, upon the environmental pressures of the world. And these are all involved in the production, maintenance, and growth of each individual. Thus we come into a physical world that is full of problems. And we come into a physical body that is full of problems. Uh, this point seems to have been generally neglected in the consideration of man and his environment. We realize that the deficiency in chemistry, in all the processes of nutrition, all these deficiencies not, not only affect the body, but condition the person inhabiting that body. We do not come into a beautiful physical uh, purity because this purity does not exist in the physical world. Thus, many temperamental problems, difficulties, uh, which we find within ourselves are very largely due to the chemical imbalances of the elements with which the body is built. We have, therefore, not only to fight against the pressures of many forces around us that we do not admire, but we are required to adjust to the conditioning influence of these processes within ourselves. We cannot entirely separate our mortal existence from the mortality which surrounds us and actually inhabits us. To meet this situation, the modern uh, thinking has developed a number of concepts of nutrition and has sought ways to overcome the most obvious and active pollutants. But by the time we grow up to the point of self-significance, before even the years of majority, we have already inhaled the problems of humanity. We have taken them into ourselves. And the nutrition that we depend upon, as even the light of the sun, is not coming to us in its best possible form. Due to this conditioning, we find that Various imbalances, deprivations of essential material, have a direct effect upon our emotions, upon our thoughts, and upon our professions, trades, and attitudes. We know that the basic discomforts of the body result in discomfort of thought and feeling. And we discover pressures within ourselves if we do not know how to explain, we do not know how to trace them for the most part. 
but they come out upon us and to us as dispositions, as attitudes, as allegiances, as loyalties and disloyalties. In other words, the human being in the body is not comfortable. Recognizing this inevitable fact, each individual is confronted with the problem of recognizing the sources of attitudes which he may believe to arise from the deepest parts of himself. They do not necessarily have this origin. And even if the basic instinct and intuition do come from within the individual, they must pass through a partly corrupted body in order to come into manifestation. And as a result of this, the body itself is unable to provide an appropriate environment for consciousness or for the higher ideal of human nature. Corruption always lowers thresholds. It always makes things less than they should be. It distorts. And in various departments of our living, <laughs> this distortion is viewed as disposition, as temperament as character, and we sort of feel that these distortions are the real self, and they are not. So getting in is not easy. Getting out is not easy. And being here is not easy. Uh, the individual makes every effort that he can, for the most part, well-intentioned, uh, to adjust to the environment in which he finds himself. And very often this adjustment itself is nothing more than a compromise. The individual does the best he can considering the conditions in which he exists. And these conditions, unfortunately, are also operating inside of him. In addition to this type of problem, the body is exposed externally to a wide variety of pressures. There are certain forms of pollution which hit us from the outside as well as from the inside. Also, we realize that world psychological pressures, many of which originally originate in biology, are continuously afflicting the best parts of ourselves. They are continually preventing us from manifesting the reality that we would like to know and understand. The ancients, therefore, gave us the concept that the body is the living temple of the living God. Each human body is a sanctuary for a spiritual entity or reality. This body, this temple, has been in various ways corrupted. Jesus said, that they had made the temple of God a place of merchandise. And he drove the merchants from the steps of the temple with a whip of small cords. More intelligently viewed, more carefully considered, this temple, which has become a place of merchandise, is also within ourselves. We have gradually lost the strength, the vitality, or the incentive to maintain properly this living temple. Most folks do not even bother to consider the body a temple. Our attitude towards our own physical structure is almost unbelievable. In the first place, to most individuals, the body is merely a servant of the purposes of the will, the mind, and the emotion. The body is merely a kind of animal which is supposed to draw wagons as horses did, which uh, is supposed to be a faithful servant to the pressures that are forced against it. We have already discovered scientifically that the moods and attitudes of the individual have a very strong effect upon the body, but we have not fully realized the power of the body itself to affect the individual. We still take it for granted that we rule the body, that it will do what we order it to do. But between the difficulties in the physical structure itself 
and the difficulties in the mental and emotional complex which dominates the body, we have many reasons to understand uh, why illness and suffering appear to be inevitable. There is no clear evidence or proof that nature itself wants man to suffer. Nature wants the individual to grow. Nature has provided an environment suitable for growth. And the human being has gradually, over a long period of time, compromised his principles and in so doing has, in one way or another, adversely conditioned the world in which he lives. So here we are, as persons, inhabiting two environments. The larger environment of the world and the smaller environment of our own body. We realize also that it's very difficult to balance uh, man's relationship to his own flesh. We have a great many health experts who are very much involved in the conditioning of the body. We know that we produce some of the world's finest athletes and that all over the world the training of the body for athletic purposes is an acknowledged procedure. But in the training of the body, we have to get into another difficulty. We are apt to gradually uh, create the concept that the body in itself is the most important of all things. We are inclined to compromise or even deny the growth of the person in the body in a very deep, powerful program of maintaining the physical form itself. Now, the physical body has laws. Everything in the universe is ruled by law. And the laws of the physical body are very simple, actually, although very difficult to enforce. The law is that the body is the instrument by means of which the individual is able to exist in this material world. Without the body, he is a vaporous abstraction. Without the body, he has no means of making the contacts with the material world around him, which are necessary uh, to the expression of his inner life or the development of his character. So we have to be a little watchful of those who give the body too much catering. It is not really good for the body to be spoiled by indulgence any more than it is good for it to be impoverished uh, by various forms of deprivation. The body has its own rule. The body is a useful servant, but not a good taskmaster. It is very important to us, but its very important depends upon its normalcy. Now we have in the world what we might call the good life. This good life is very largely lived at the expense of health. It is a means of indulgence of appetite. Now, appetites actually do not originate in the body itself. They are conferred upon it. But in the gratification of the emotional and psychical appetite, the individual may destroy the body or make it continually more infirm and incapable of giving its proper cooperation to the inner life which inhabits it. So the care of the body requires a kind of agricultural outlook in which it must be provided with everything necessary, but that if it is overindulged, it in turn gradually develops a kind of tyranny which is given to it by the emotional and mental ambitions of the owner thereof. Going a little further into this situation, we come upon natural protection by which the body seeks to restore itself. The body is a tremendously complicated mechanism. But in the process of its development in millions of years, it has also built strong defense mechanisms. These mechanisms for function, however, must be uh, given the cooperation of the person inhabiting it. Therefore, we know from sad experience that what we might term the simple life is the best for the body. 
It is proper for it to receive nutrition. It is proper for it to receive exercise. It is pro- proper for it to practice a proper hygiene. But in all things, we treat the body as a faithful friend. And if we spoil a friendship, we are in trouble. In the course of time, appetites arising in the emotional nature of the individual have come to practically control the attitude of the mind towards the body. On the one hand, there is a complete ignorance. The body simply is there, it's ours, and when we can do with it as we please, and it uh, must either cooperate or we consider the body to be at fault. Actually, it is impossible for a body governed by natural law uh, to work in harmony with a mind or emotion that is a viol- that is violating natural law. So the conflict between the natural needs of the body and the artificial activities of the individual, uh, this conflict is bound to result in bad health. Now the body being inferior to the being inhabiting it can be and often is seriously uh, endangered by our way of life. The body needs a proper environment. And in our present intense scientific industrialism, the body of the individual is sacrificed to external factors that are themselves not necessarily valid. The body is expected to perform all kinds of labors. It is brought under the control of an economic theory in which people employ the body rather than the person in it. And if the body fails, the abilities of the person are rejected. If we live in a world in which most of human activity is devoted to a single purpose, and that is economic maintenance, the body is going to be one of the primary victims. It is not intended to be so treated. It is not intended to work deep under the earth hour after hour, year after year. It is not intended to be locked into an industrial situation in which there is no incentive uh, for the development of the person in the body. This person becomes merely a servant of of a world economic institution. And as a result of that, in turn, the body suffers and gradually falls into a variety of infirmities. So the prudent life is one in which there is a reasonable distribution of efforts, where the body is cared for by proper recreation, relaxation, and rest, and nutrition, and the person in the body is enabled to have a form, a material structure, that gives opportunity for the expression of its over self, or the divine in man. Materialism is very largely involved in this complex inasmuch as materialism estimates the value of a complete human being in terms of his economic productivity. He is here not to be a person, but to maintain an ever-expanding system of world industry. This industry takes the person away from the natural habits of life, deprives him in many instances of the proper emotional uh, or integration in his home, in his business, everywhere that he functions. He is gradually being locked into a kind of life that is now governed largely by computerization. But all this means sickness. It means trouble. It means the fact that the individual has not recognized the true nature of his own instruction. This body is his house. It is his duty to keep this house as best he can, to protect it, and to gradually realize that it is not his own house alone. It is the house of his God. It is the house of the divine power which manifests through him. To keep this house is therefore not merely a physical responsibility, it is a spiritual responsibility. Because if it is allowed to fall into disorder, That part of man which is the important part, the governing part, 
the part which is tied to the universe and tied to the divine plan of things is forbidden natural expression. The body captured into one of these unfortunate patterns nearly always gives us warnings of approaching evil. It tells us by our own reaction that something is amiss. We discover it when we ask, we find our disposition falls apart. We find it when we observe that jealousies and all kinds of uh, com- competitive attitudes uh, make life very difficult. Another phase of the body is that it is by nature equipped to combat nearly all of the diseases which commonly affect the flesh. The body has its own protective mechanism. But if this mechanism is disarranged, or the various processes of the body are corrupted, it is no longer able to meet the need and challenge of external situations. We realize, for example, that the body can protect us from most diseases that come from um, parasites, bacteria, germs, and things of this nature. It is constantly throwing off from itself what has been called an invisible atmosphere. This is a sort of aura, and it is a defense against the intrusion of physical destructive factors. This defense will very often enable the individual to protect his health, to guard his, his, his life, and to avoid the contagions and infections uh, which are all too prevalent. But in order to do this, we must recognize an, an analogy. Uh, most persons who uh, are not well organized psychologically are more open to sickness than those who are better integrated. The reason being obvious, that the well-integrated person inhabiting the body is a benefactor, helps the body to maintain its own proper functions. Uh, When the inner life becomes disturbed, it reacts upon the body, lowering resistance uh, to the danger of internal corruption and also from environmental contagions and infections. The magnetic field of the body does give us a kind of invisible perspiration. It is an invisible kind of fur which covers the body. And the hair on the body is more or less merely a crystallization around this type of energy, which corresponds in nature around us to the vegetable kingdom. By keeping the magnetic field fairly well adjusted, The individual, therefore, will protect himself against the diseases arising in his own mind and the ailments that come to him from the outside. We have various means of combating various ailments, but we have also developed a very pernicious situation which will have to be faced ultimately by every thoughtful person, and that is the failure of the theory in medicine of protecting health. We are working more to find ways to remedy our own mistakes, but we are not being much instructed on how to prevent these mistakes. We may get a nutritionist who will help us to balance the body, but this same balance of the body may not touch into the inner causes of deterioration. Because an an unhealthy mind, even in a healthy body, will ultimately destroy health. We are also trying to remove the symptoms of our own indiscretions. We are developing an elaborate pharmacology which is dedicated largely to obscuring mistakes. We are trying to neglect or kill out the body's natural means of bringing problems to the attention of the mind. We are, uh, therefore, of the opinion, in general, that if we can abolish the symptom, that we have cured the ailment. This is not true and never can be. 
And many of the medications that we use are actually destructive of the body and its own natural resources. So we have covered a mistake, a basic mistake, by finding artificial remedies to obscure the truth. And we feel that if we have obscured the truth, all is well. We are now in the midst of a more or less obvious medical revolution in which the study of these dangerous drugs is coming into the foreground. We are trying to use drugs as a substitute of the right conduct. And there's just no way in which this can be accomplished. If we allow the retiring and uh, developing resources of the body to work as they should, we will not find it necessary, except in a great emergency, uh, to come to its assistance. If we are able to do things well. One of the basic theories is not the opposite was that nearly all physical ailments are due to obstruction. Some process of the body has been prevented from expressing itself in a normal way. As a result of that, the body forces or rushes to the aid of the situation many resources of its own. But these resources, if they are abused, and if the condition does not come to the conscious attention of the owner of the body, will very often result in a congestion in which function is disarranged. Until this congestion is broken up, the normal processes of the body cannot be restored. Now as we go a little further into the subject, uh, we realize that the Kabbalists of old and other mystic groups have recognized that the body is the microcosm of the universe. The body is a miniature of all things. And strange it may seem, the body is a very primitive creature. Uh, from the trilobites on up and down, uh, these bodies are all actually uh, miniatures of a universal pattern. They are all the m- small uh, archetypal architectural forms by which the complete geometry of space is epitomized into one small uh, area. And uh, all these natural forms take universal mathematical geometrical structure. We know this in science. We know that mathematics and um, geometry are the great keys uh, to universal order. And they are nowhere more evident than in the physical body. Among those who worked very hard in early days to understand this were, remarkably enough, not scientists, but artists. Artists were the first to really contemplate the body. To them, the human form was one of the most beautiful structures that nature has produced. And in studying this structure, uh, the artist in an effort to uh, transfer it to canvas or to paper or to carve it in stone or marble, had to become keenly aware of the substructure of the body. He realized that he could not simply copy the surface. When he did, the work was superficial and inadequate. So we are indebted to people like Albert Dura, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci for the careful study of body structure. Out of this study came patterns like the dynamic symmetry. We found gradually the whole system of Pythagorean mathematics caught and captured and held in the bodily structure. We began to recognize that the measurements of the body were highly significant. And among the uh, early medieval Kabbalists, uh, there was a system of analysis of character by carefully measuring the relationships between structure in the body. It was also observed that stress, all these factors, strain, all were involved in body protective mechanisms. We learned architectural principles of stress from the structure of the body and the muscles. 
everything that we really have on the outside of us is simply a broadening and generalizing of the structure within us. And most of all, there was a wisdom in it. And that wisdom was that the natural procedures of nature in bringing formal structures into manifestation, these procedures were one of man's most available sources of instruction, by means of which he might learn of all things by becoming aware of a few things in their action upon each other. In the same sense, therefore, the body gradually becomes analogous to the great cathedral. The great cathedral was a masterpiece of human engineering, but the human body is a masterpiece of divine engineering. And no rule that is going to stand in nature around us or in man's achievements can go contrary to the rule governing the creation of the physical form. The physical form was not really physical in origin. It was physical by extension. It is a body built by energy around an invisible core. And these energies flowing out of their own vitality enable this body to become a manifestation of themselves. The whole divine plan is revealed through man. In another analogy, we can go to some of the old Rosicrucian concepts of the 17th century, by means of which it was clearly indicated uh, that the body was the small book. There were three great books upon which man could depend for honest information. In the Rosicrucian mysteries, the first of these was the Holy Scripture, the book of the prophets the book of the messianic dispensation, the book of the way of life, that in morality, integrity, and beauty. The second great manifestation, the great book, was the universe, in which man, by gradually exploring the infinite resources of space around him, and gradually becoming aware of the laws moving inevitably and immutably through this space, the individual, by the study, of the universe, the created composite body of all things, could come to better understand the creator, and finally by downgrading a little bit, in a sense, uh, its perspective, it could come finally to the realization that man himself was the third book. The man himself was the miniature in which things vast and impenetrable might become more obvious more simple and more direct uh, to our attention. It is not so easy to fathom the mysteries of deity or the Holy Scriptures. It is not within everyone's capacity uh, to understand the universe as it, and, it, and all of its mysterious workings. But when these things are brought together in a little model, a miniature of the whole, they are available to us every day in every walk of life. They are closer to us than any physical relationship that can exist because they are part of ourselves. And by exploring the little universe ourselves, we not only become more aware of the greater universe, but we also become aware that this great universe is also within us. That all of the great principles of truth, all of the great wisdom of the ages, all of the great spiritual revelations, are brought downward in a mysterious way and locked within the body of the human being. It is difficult to understand some of these mysteries, but they have been worked on rather conscientiously and reverently for very long periods of time. Now, as we enter a little closer to the body and begin to study its structure, we know that the body exists for one purpose only, and that is to reveal that which is within it. The body exists to provide an appropriate instrument for the measurements and for the manifestations of the human soul. Thus, the body has to have a formal structure suitable to meet the same needs that the universe had when it came forth out of the pre-existent condition of things. 
The body, therefore, has to be more than a mass of matter. It has to be more than a, a mere machine. It has to become a means for the expression of that which is within it. And in order to do this, the same processes were necessary as those which brought forth the larger universe. The universe consists of energies moving through organization. And we know that the great cosmological systems of antiquity were really symbolical of the anatomy and physiology of man. Many ancient religions, including those of India and China, based much of their philosophy upon the human body. They did not call it that directly, but they compared various parts of the human body with universal procedures and found that the analogies were accurate and inevitable and true. Under these conditions, what do we find? Primarily, that the body is divisible into systems or parts. These systems or parts are all of them created to make possible the compound function of man. The first thing we realize is that the human being as a body is a commonwealth. We also realize that this body is the most magnificent example of cooperation that exists to our knowledge and understanding. There is cooperation in the parts of the body that we have never been able to find in human society. This cooperation means that all parts are working together for the common good. This is something that we know is necessary, but we have never been able to take this great truth and expand it into our collective existence. We realize that in the body, nothing is indispensable. We realize that within the body, all sections, parts, elements, degrees of bodily existence are in a magnificent homogeneous pattern that they are working together forever and that a discord is artificial to them and is not natural to them. The body then represents in a sense humanity. It gives us an understanding of the relationship of parts to the whole. Within the body of man, there are more separate living entities than there are creatures upon the surface of the earth. Not only does this involve human beings, but every form of life that exists. Within the human body, there is a far greater assembly of life than to be found anywhere else. But because these units are so small that we cannot see them, because they sometimes are born and die within a few hours. Because they are so completely involved in the structures which they nourish and sustain. We simply lose sight of the fact that we are not one being alone. But that the human body is a field of evolution for millions and billions of living things. Everyone, therefore, has his own kingdom. He has an empire over which he rules. And he can be a good ruler or he can be a tyrant. He can uh, serve this body's needs properly or he can use it to exploit its resources for the advancement of his ambitions or his own self-centeredness. If he does this, he is a bad governor. And as a bad governor, he will ultimately be deposed. And we see around us today in society where one tyrant after another uh, loses power, where revolution after revolution upsets the earth, and where one tyranny is largely uh, supplemented by another. But this is bad government, and it is contrary to the magnificent cooperation which makes up the human being himself. It tells us beyond doubt that we must live together in peace or the common body will perish and that any disturbance which is neglected any misunderstanding or misinterpretation which is allowed to continue will produce within the body the same anarchy that it produces politically in society 
So we have, we are our brother's keeper in a sense. We are certainly the keeper of the life that has been given to us. If we are gods in the making, it is time for us to make good our kingdom right here where it is. And that begins by the proper understanding of what constitutes normal, proper relationship between governing and governed. Now, the governing in man is not perfect either. We are all growing and unfolding creatures. We are releasing little by little the divine potential which is within us. We may not always be able to be the wisest of governors, but we do have the responsibility to make a good try. We are responsible to be as nearly good rulers as possible. So we may say to ourselves, where do we find the guides? Where do we find the information necessary to help us to be good rulers? The Greeks believed that we could find it largely by consideration of living bodies and through autopsy, in which the inner structure is made known, which for a long time human beings failed to understand at all. It was not until the rise of the Thalius that the study of the human anatomy was more or less organized. And in this study, we discover that underneath the skin, there is one of the most complex and magnificent structures that can possibly be imagined. And that all this structure is, in a sense, part of what is necessary to maintain the composite body. Without realizing this, we lose most of the significance of our own lives. And, and no one who has a fair study of anatomy and physiology and histology can deny that if from these forms of learning we can find what keeps the body in order. But what we haven't done is to moralize on this. We have not recognized it as a symbol of the larger world in which we live. Now today we are in a great crisis in the world. We were a crisis in which we discover that the lack of cooperation, the lack of dedication, the lack of the realization that humanity is a body and that this body is in soul and that the corruptions by which human beings relate to each other, these corruptions cause world sickness just as they cause confusion within the body itself. So we have the heart and its structure. Now, the heart structure is a septenary, for within it, as we are told in the book of Genesis, the spirits of Elohim moved upon the face surface of the deep. The heart has its own hierarchy. It has its own agencies. It has its own angels and archangels and powers and principalities. It is a tremendous, mysterious structure, and it has to be administered to an infinite uh, concatenation of supporting uh, fu functions and factors. The mystery of the heart is something that we really think very little about unless something goes wrong with it. And then, probably more than in any other type of ailment, uh, a kind of fear sets in upon us. Because only under those conditions do we really begin to understand what the heart means. And it is only in the failure of civilization, in its own adjustments, that we finally come to understand what the failure of love means. That all things are primarily sustained by a power which has as its primary purpose the survival and preservation of all that lives. So even in the heart of the smallest creature, or in some little vortex, which is equivalent to in a primitive form to the heart focus. We know that the part of man which is above the physical has its final pole and its final center in the body in the apex of the left ventricle of the heart. Here it is it is the pacemaker. Here it is that mysterious thing which plays the melody of life. The heart is the basis of life and the heart serves all life, without discrimination. We may say it has its own internal discrimination, but it does not play favorites with any part of the body 
but serves them all as the one power which gives them life and makes possible the continuance of their existence. So it is actually that which, in a sense, becomes the symbol or the presence of the divine in man. In the books of Hermes, it is written that the eternal power placed itself in the mysterious pyramid of the heart, and that the pyramid in Giza was an ancient mathematical formula to represent the heart of life. The uh, wonderful Septapanaka cave of initiation in Buddhism is the heart. And in mysticism, all illumination arises from the power that is seated in the heart. For illumination is life. And life properly directed and normally expressed is illumination. Now, the second great power of the human body is another factor. And this second factor is derived again from evolutionary processes. And this factor is the mind. And the mind is centered in the brain. And the brain is again one of the most marvelous symbolical instruments that we can possibly imagine. The brain is more or less constantly in action, and from it flows the river of life which we call the spinal cord, and in turn adds something else to the construction of the complete person. This something else that is added is the control of the body by the mind. It is through the mind that the person in the body is able to administer the life which is seated in the heart. Therefore, there has to be a complete uh, cooperation between the heart and the mind. The heart gives the energy to the mind by which it lives. But the mind, in turn, has a function. The mind, in a sense, we might say, is an executive guarding and uh, protecting the body. Now, the mind of the average individual is not exactly protective in all cases. There seems to be some problem arise here. We find that the mind is very much like an arrogant adolescent. The mind decides that it is running everything. It forgets the fact that if the heart stops for a minute, the empire of the mind falls apart. We do not realize probably adequately in our interrelationships with other things that the failure of love destroys thought. That once the mind is no longer cooperating, it is inevitably cutting itself off from its own supply. It has refused to recognize, as man refuses, that there is a divine power superior to thought. In Eastern philosophy, man is called Manus, the thinker. And uh, the thinker is a very important part of this great economy. It is the thinker which would enable man to learn how to take care of his own body. It is the thinker that can give him dedications, by means of which he takes the divine energy within him and uses it for the perfection of society. The mind also is capable of a gradual advancement of itself until through mysticism it is finally absorbed in illumination. And illumination itself is merely an aspect of the infinite divine love located in the heart. Actually, therefore, the mind becomes a kind of prime minister. The mind is there because without mental controls the body cannot serve its purposes. From the mind to the brain, therefore, there must be an adequate link. And this link is found by the study of the internal structure of the brain, where its ventricles, the ductus glands that are located there, and many other phases of, it, of development, uh, reveal uh, the true mystery of the mind itself. For the mind is as Aristotle says, is united to the body by an isthmus. This isthmus being the neck, which is the bridge between the mind and the body. And in the mind itself, there is the seat of what might be termed uh, the initiate government. It is located as a servant of the heart. It is there to make certain that the 
life of the heart is interpreted into the integrity of the brain. The brain, of course, is only the shadow of the heart, of the mind. But it is a very important thing. It's, that, it's various parts, it's convolutions, and it's ventricles, and all of the various faculty centers that are located there gradually reveals to us the complete control which the mind can exercise over bodily function. But in order to do this, the mind itself and its body, the brain, by which we recognize the mind, must be understood. The purpose of the mind is not to create its own empire. But when a dictator in the individual, his own ego, decides to use the intellectual equipment merely to the advancement of his own purposes, he betrays its real purpose and betrays the body of which it is a part. So that the properly conditioned mind is the gentle and kindly and humble servant of life itself, and not a little de- tyrant or despot set up to enable one individual to be richer than another. We have the mind coming through the brain, and that part of the mind which is functioning in the material world is brain-centered, and from that must come wisdom. And wisdom is the power of the brain to interpret the life of the heart, to make sure that all things are fulfilled according to the law. It is the property and purpose of the brain to so control the conduct of the body that no discord can arise therein, nor can there be any discord between the individual brain and its mind uh, background and any other brain anywhere in the world. Because there is one universal mind, and when it is broken up into individualities, then these often become competitive. But there is no more competition actually possible than there is, it is possible for the brain itself to go against the dictates of the heart. If it does so, all is lost. The third great pole in the human body is the, re, is the generative system. This is what has been placed here as what Plato calls the eighth power of the soul. This is the perpetuation of life. This is the means by means of which there is continuity. There is the fulfillment of a law for the providing of bodies to souls until their evolution in this plane of existence is finished. The generative power, therefore, to the ancients was always sacred, one of the most sacred of all powers. It was supposed to be founded in the power of the heart, which was infinite love life, supported, directed, controlled by the mind, which uh, becomes, in a sense, the most direct factor in the reproductive structure. For the uh, real drive of reproduction is located in the brain. The um, reproductive process falling into abuse, falling into excess, becomes again an enemy just as serious as materialism is when it becomes the controlling power of the mind. The generative system perpetuates life. It creates the forms and bodies by means of which the invisible entities which come into manifestation find the open door into, into mortal life. When they come into this mortal life, they then call upon the other powers, because the mind as father and the heart as mother must not only in the case of the world, but in the case of the in- individual, must recognize a moral responsibility to life itself. We know all too well that the gradual decline of moral ethics is a tragedy, not only to world peace, world insights, world understanding, but to the healthy perpetuation of the race to which we belong. This type of problem reveals, therefore, in the human body a triune deity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, a power of wisdom, strength, and beauty, 
a power to create, a power to rule and wisely govern that which is created, and a power to constantly improve the quality of creation. All these things are part of man's own structure. They're not something that was written in clouds on the sky or something. They are the daily experience of people. And in the presence of this, uh, there seems to be a very great need for deeper understanding. Now, when the, we come to find that the body must be taken care of, and that these triune powers must have their own uh, centers of function and must direct the manifestation of life, we then have the vital organs, which are distributed throughout the body. And perhaps one of the most important factors in this aspect of the subject is the process of nutrition. For all the parts of man's digestive and assimilative and excretory systems are parts of alchemy. Well, ultimately, we are going to find that alchemy and Kabbalah and all of these different phases of learning are merely symbolical of actual processes occurring within the human body. When we begin to appreciate this, we will have a new reason for the researching of these interesting and really very important fields. They are there to tell us a story. They are there to help us to understand something. In the process of nourishing the body, various elements combine. Some of these work through the magnetic field, such as the influence of planets and stars. Uh, some uh, work through the elementary atmosphere, the four elements of the ancients, and these produce certain elementary and elementary processes. Then we come down to the simple physical body of food. What is food? Food is life. And food is one great nutritional principle. When we take into our bodies various foods, they simply do not rush to one part of the body or another and set up abodes there. We don't have asparagus in one place and turnips in another. All of these uh, food factors are passed through an alchemical transformation. The human uh, system, particularly the digestive system, takes these faculties, break, uh, takes these facilities, breaks them down to their essences, and in an essential form of life, then distributes them. So that we are not living off of cheese or macaroni. We are living off of a life principle that is present in all forms of nutritive material. All of this material is taken in, loses its own identity, and is transformed into a common substance that can be handled by the body. This is the most extraordinary form of alchemy that exists. For in this case, it takes food, which constitutes base elements, and transfers or transforms these foods into the spiritual gold by which life is sustained. So this part of the problem is very, very essential and, and very important. But it is necessary to part of the great economy, the great economy of things. Uh, there are old diagrams in which uh, the intestinal tract is corresponded to the mysterious underworlds of Dante's Inferno and Milton's Paradise Lost. This system of assimilation and finally the excretion of impurities comes in a sense under a purgatorial function. It is a mysterious realm in which what is not useful is discarded. Discarded by a wisdom and skill that the human being could not personally apply any more than he could control completely the function of his own heart. If we depended upon man to keep the heart beating, he would forget it sometime and die on the spot. <laughs> but the control is in, in an area which he cannot dominate. He can influence it. He can influence it for better and for worse. He can discipline it in certain mystical exercises. He can change its beat, rate, but if he does so without great skill, he may disorganize the entire structure. 
because that which abides in the heart is wiser than can be given to it by the mind. So we also then come into other areas of which it is important to take consideration. Uh, the uh, ancients were particularly influenced by the shape of man, and uh, usually represented this form either in a cross or in a five-pointed star. The five-pointed star is the form we find most commonly shown in old Pythagorean researches. It represents the body with its five major points, the head, the two arms, and the two legs. This uh, form was the basis of most of the cathedrals of Europe. And, of course, the cruciform standing person with feet together and arms spread out became the cross. And in the center of the cross was always the symbol of life itself. And in the cruciform temple, the altar is in the place where the heart is. For it is but the altar that the eternal speaks through the oracles of wisdom. So the shape of the body became quite important. And it was also more or less considered very essential that the individual recognize the need for the complete cooperation of the two sides of his own body. These two sides, the right and the left, are known to the ancients and were studied and symbolically considered and it was assumed that the right side of the body was for, for defense and the left side for protection. The ancient uh, Roman legionnaire he carried his spear in the right hand and held his shield against the body with the left. We find discussions of this particular point in the Kabbalah. Uh, where the virtues, values, and problems involving the right and the left are very clearly set out. We also find them perpetuated in heraldry, where the two points uh, or areas are of the greatest importance. Now, the problem of the hands, for example, or the feet, has to do with the manifestation of the individual in the daily activities and concerns of life. And it is obvious that we would be in very serious difficulty if any kind of political competition arose between these members. If we had a foot that was going in one direction and another foot that was going in the opposite direction, our general progress would be hopelessly prevented. If we have two hands and one hand wishes to do one thing and the opposite hand wishes to do something else, which is incompatible, or in contrary, we are in trouble. If we use the hands to knock someone down, or to injure, this is a perversion of power. If we use the hands as a form of communication, as in the case of the deaf, they become very important means of, of carrying on a progress of some type of essential learning. The hands have many uses. Each finger has its own meaning. The feet have many uses and purposes. The lines of the hand have been the subject of a great deal of study, and in many instances it is obvious that they are very, very important. The uh, problem, therefore, is that we have hands and feet, and these hands and feet have to work together. And in our material environment, hands and feet are symbolized by the machinery of productivity. The things that we have to do, the survival of the physical body in the presence of danger, transforms the hands and feet into legionnaires. They become the defenders of man. They become also the means for the expansion of his knowledge in many ways and properly trained, they become magnificent instruments of the arts. And where they are there to guide us skillfully and physically to the problems of life, they have their part, and they are under mental control. Where, however, they give us great music, great art, wonderful appreciations for things, give us the opportunity to reveal from within ourselves something of the beauty that is there, then they are directly under the influence of the heart. And it is beauty, finally, that must redeem the rest. 
So we have in the body all kinds of interesting and more or less remarkable lessons. Uh, we find all types of processes, stress processes, uh, mending processes, the constant replenishment of the body, the fact that it is one body, but that the life within it is manifold. And the individual, it has been said, and probably quite correctly, that by the end of a seven-year period, every cell in the human body has been changed. In the course of a hundred years, every embodiment of man in the world is changed completely. Therefore, the continuity of the body depends upon the constant perpetuation of the life centers within it. The blood must reproduce itself or we must have leukemia. We must have reproduction of the cells in every bone, in every muscle, in every nerve, or the structure falls apart. And this is where the principle of generation becomes very important. For generation is not only the reproduction of the species, it is the reproduction of the life units within the individual. He has to be constantly rebuilding. And when the body ceases to rebuild, uh, then uh, life has passed its peak. We cannot continue and uh, go on any further. Now, the body also contains the polarities of the sensory perceptions. These sensory perceptions in themselves are very important. Man, in his evolution over thousands, millions of years, has developed one by one the sensory perceptions as the environmental condition made them necessary. As, long, as soon as there was something to see, man could see it. As soon as there was something to hear, he could hear it. And, it, and uh, every type of the sensory perception was geared to a purpose and to a value and to a need. Today, our, probably our most important sensory function is sight, which was the last to come to us and has been variously uh, specialized in different kingdoms of nature. The sight to us is the ability to look out of a window. Now, actually, of course, we think we are looking out, but actually, the uh, sight factor is not in the eye, but in the brain. But sight has given us a tremendous area of educational opportunity. It has made possible for us to be observers of existence. It has made it possible for us to see what is going on around us. And then, blocked within the brain, is another eye, the single eye, by which we see gradually what is going on within us. But at the moment, sight is largely located in the area of perception. But the brain has a faculty to balance this, and that is reflection. Everything seen stimulates interpretation, stimulates some form of moral, ethical, or spiritual truth. It makes it possible for us to observe both virtues and vices. It gives us the possibility to study the whole balance of nature. And by means of sight, the individual gains his greatest physical orientation, as far as he is capable of such orientation at the present time. But it is obvious that sight, as if we know it, is not complete. It is also a known fact that the capacity of the brain has not yet been fully recognized. For the most part, we are thinking on the surface of the brain structure. But there is a dimension of depth to it, and the brain is capable of a vast improvement or vast extension of its own powers. But at the present moment, sight it becomes almost a contact with the divine plan. We look around us, and we see things, and we like some of them, and we dislike others. We watch things created and beautiful. We watch things disintegrate and tear down and fail. These are all experiences of sight. But they are very important because to see the environment in which we exist is to be aware of it more acutely than by any other faculty. And therefore, it is the one great educator that we have among the sensory perceptions. It is the power 
to estimate. It, it builds into the brain mechanism the structure of discrimination, the, the structure of comparisons, and also it brings us in direct focus to the operations of cause and consequence. Cause and effect are probably more obvious to us through sight than through any other faculty that we possess. But all the faculties have their proper places and their proper endowments. Each one has a message. Each one is a messenger. Actually, we have given comparatively little attention to the evolution of sensory perceptions. We take them all for granted. We do not realize that they can be greatly improved. We do not try to balance them. We do not try to create a powerful cooperation between them. We simply accept them and are very little mindful of them unless they fail us. Then we suddenly find that some phase of life has been slowly taken away from us. So the sight centers, the sensory perceptions, and all these contacts are a way, the way in which the person uh, becomes oriented. Because the person becomes aware of things. Now, then the moment the five senses operate together, and awareness is established, everything then depends upon the function of the mental coordinator. Because things seen can be nullified by attitudes. That which might in itself be important is disregarded by an indifferent mental mechanism. That which to the mind is not important uh, can gain strange importance in the sensory perceptions. And sometimes this results in an extension of knowledge. But in all these different areas, the sensory perceptions have to be refined. They also have to be improved, and they must be brought into a cooperative relationship. Whereas today, no matter how many people look at the same thing, it looks different to all of them. This is due to limitations within the individual. And these limitations are artificial. Because in reality, all things seen are the same when seen by all people. But immediately the sight factor itself is compromised by ulterior mental attitudes, so that we lose a great part of the virtue of these various sensory perceptions that have been so carefully and wisely developed. The body, therefore, does manifest through sensory function, and through this function, gains uh, a new and more complete perspective upon the circumstances under which the body is going to subsist for a time. All of this together, and very, very much more, brings us to the final realization that this body is indeed a sacred thing, that it has been given to us for a reason, for a purpose, it has been bestowed upon us that we might grow, that we might improve, that we might strengthen our resolutions, and that most of all we should be true to it. Not to cater to it, but to preserve it in the best normal way that we can. In so doing, we will protect our own mental and emotional normalcy. For when the body is in pain and suffering, when irritation affects us, when we are debilitated, or run down, or in some way suffer from wrong nutrition, our whole capacity to live is impaired. It is very important, therefore, to recognize that we must bring the body into a cooperative relationship with life. And this, in a sense, is almost impossible unless we recognize the sacred fact unless we realize that we are the living temple of the living God. We cannot perhaps have the courage or the strength to do as we should with the body. Also, it will help us, if we have this attitude, to realize that the divine will that is in the sanctum sanctorum of the temple, that is in the mysterious symbol above the high altar, that the divine will is instructing us and that its revelations are coming to us 
uh, through this body, and that this body, therefore, is indeed a truly sacred thing, that it is something that we should understand, that we should really come into harmony with, and that we should use it as it was intended. Now, there is no doubt in the world that in, while we are in the material world, part of our bodily function has to be related to material things. It is here, however, that that which is above the material must come through into the material, or our civilization can never survive. That which we give to the world from within ourselves must become, in part at least, what the world will become. And in these times when everything seems so extremely difficult, we have two consolations that we learn from the Bible, from the body. One is that there is with us at all times an available instruction in realities. We are forever in the presence of the thing as it is, whether we interpret it so or not. Whether we are able to live with it or not depends upon our own attitude towards the reality itself. If then, instead of going around this world as sort of little autocrats run by the mind, we could become the humble servants of the divine ruled by the heart. If we can humble ourselves and accept the leadership of reality, most of our problems will be solved. If we obey the simple commandments of integrity, if we truly learn to love one another, if we truly turn and take the various pressures and emotions of life and sublimate them into kindness, compassion, and can get over the idea of separateness and realize that one life ensouls us all. Gradually, we can build into our own lives a blessedness greater than we have known before. We also will find a purpose of our lives. We will find that no external circumstance can destroy that purpose so long as it is alive in our hearts. As long as the individual keeps the faith, the faith will keep him. But when he wanders away and uses all of these functions and faculties, and the body itself, merely to advance some small personal ambitions of his own, the real purpose of life is lost. The reason for our being here is lost. And we also build a, a, a barrier, because it seems to the average person that the ideals that he has the dreams that he has, the hopes that he has, all of these are frustrated by conditions around him. This is not actually true. As long as the heart beats within the individual, he can be true to the realities of life. It is that which gives him life, and not his bank account or his stockholders. That mysterious little point in the heart is the reason why he lives. And if he serves that mysterious form, it will be the reason why he experiences security in a troubled world. And as he experiences this, he will receive within it the final law which we have to find ways to enforce or to apply. And that is that the gradual unfoldment of the spiritual mystery within the heart overcomes the separateness of life. And we realize there is only one heart, and that heart is the heart of the divine. And at all other things, everywhere that pulse is beating, simply because there is God in everything. And to understand that, and to live according to it, will overcome most of the discouragements due to a world that does not understand. We have the right to understand the world, even though it never understands us. Thank you.